This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. Welcome to Godsplaining. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to Godsplaining wherever you listen to your podcasts. This is a special time, as you might have noticed, because we have a guest splaining episode. And this time we are joined by a professor of philosophy at Catholic University of America. This will be Professor Michael Gorman. Professor Gorman, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, that's and Professor Gorman is uh, just a little bio here. Um, since you may not know, he's, he has popular podcasts, of course, I'm sure, and with uh, different things. But um, his work mainly academics, of course, as ordinary professor, ordinary professor, but really extraordinary. But that's just how it goes. The title is ordinary. Extraordinary is the one where like you come in occasionally. You know, ordinary minister is the ordinary professor is the really important one uh, at the School of Philosophy at at uh, Catholic University of America. Um, now, the, what's distinctive about Professor Gorman, of course, is he's got a German type of background in the sense that he has two doctorates. He is not only a doctorate in philosophy, but also a doctor in theology. So Professor Gorman began, did some studies in Toronto, his BA, and then uh, Catholic University of America for the PHL, and then the State University of New York at Buffalo, working under Professor Gracia uh, for a PhD in philosophy, before then saying, well, let's do theology at Boston College, which is run by a particular religious order that is not the Dominicans. Um, and he got a PhD there. And then after teaching for bits, joined the Catholic University of America to teach. Uh, he, he has known for a number of books but and articles, but the most important one, I suppose, for anyone listening to this podcast is a devotional work um, called Aquinas on the <laughs> metaphysics of the hypostatic union. So this is great for Lent or Advent reading. Um, it's a philosophical uh, discussion of the hypostatic union of Christ as two natures, uh, one person sort of thing. So, Professor Gorman, did I miss anything with the introduction, or do you have any other devotional reading that you're that's in the works? <laughs> Devotionally. No, that's great. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, Professor Gorman, you have a doctorate in both philosophy and a doctorate in theology. So, other than a desire for severe pain and academic, uh, I don't know, torture, what made you get a, want to get a doctorate in both of these things? Well, okay, so actually it's a sort of a good example of why you should not try too hard to plan your life. My original plan was to get the master's or, or licentiate in philosophy and then to go on and study theology and be a theologian. Um, I got married. My wife was studying engineering in Buffalo. So I was just kind of hanging out. But then her studies took longer than we had planned. And to make a long story short, I needed something to do. So I entered this philosophy program and got a doctorate in philosophy. And then I went on and did the theology degree. Um, and then I applied for jobs in both fields and I ended up in philosophy. So it's a good thing I had that degree. So it did not go the way I had planned it to go, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want, so a lot of people, when we go out and do, do talks and things and people ask, um, what's the difference between, uh, uh, being a theologian or being a philosopher and you are both in a sense, a theologian and a philosopher, yeah. would you, how do you, how do you characterize or what do you, how would you explain the difference you could say between thinking theologically maybe? And right. thinking philosophically. Maybe that's Good, the, yeah. the best place to ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, there's two ways to think about that question. One is, like, what conceptually is the difference between the two fields? And the mm -hmm. other one is sort of more sociological. What is it like to do one or something? But I think you're, I take it you're interested in the first one. So, yes, that's right. Yeah. So, both, so what philosophy and theology have in common, uh, in contrast with other fields of study, is that they ask maximally fundamental questions, mm. maximally basic questions. So, you know, if I have a question for you about some point of grammar, that's a good question, but it's not a very basic question. But if we start talking about grammar and after a while, we're like, well, what are words in the first place? Mm -hmm. Right now, all of a sudden, it's getting kind of, as people say, it's getting kind of philosophical, right? Well, mm -hmm. that's true because you're getting more and more down to the foundations or roots of things. So philosophy and theology have in common that they ask maximally foundational questions. 
Um, other fields ask are also important. They ask questions that are less foundational, but more detailed, and they're both important. Like if you only had philosophy, you would have a lot of generalities, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what makes them different? Um, philosophy does n the the main thing, there's not like a primary thing and a secondary thing. The primary thing is that theology relies on, in part, on revelation. So you can appeal to divine revelation and say, this is true and we should accept it because God has revealed it to us. Where in philosophy, you don't make that move. You, you use natural reason, unaided, unaided by revelation. So that's the primary difference. The secondary difference is that um, in philosophy, you're mostly talking about created things. You do talk about God, but mostly when you talk about God in philosophy, you're talking about God as the cause of created things. Mm -hmm. Whereas in theology, you're mostly talking about God. And when you talk about created things, you talk about them in their relationship to God. This is not a hard and fast distinction. That's why right. I keep saying things like mostly. Um, but it does it does make a difference. And the only other thing I would want to add here is that that's, I, I mean, I suppose fairly clear conceptually, the distinction that I just laid out. But in practice, I think it's important not to be too obsessive or scrupulous. When you're trying to solve a problem, just try to solve the problem. And mm -hmm. if you're doing philosophy for a while, great. And then if you need to shift over and to draw on some theology or some sociology or some mathematics, just do what you got to do to get the answer to your question. And don't be too scrupulous. Like, uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm not doing philosophy right now. I mean, you know, if you're like paid to teach philosophy, you got to keep the philosophy content of your classes, you know, up around 98%, right? Because that's your job. But I'm t if you're like being a normal person and you're just trying to think things through, it's the distinction between philosophy and theology is interesting and it's important, but it's not like you have some obligation to, to stick to one particular mode of inquiry. Right. Now, maybe we, and maybe it's a good point to say we haven't defined our terms of, so theology, most people listening uh, probably know what that Catholic theology and dogma and this sort of thing, but philosophy, of course, a lot of people think, well, What's that? Um, because yeah. you said sociology, and you might say, well, I'm a Foucaultian, and so I think philosophy is just sociology. Or you say grammar, and you say, I'm a Derridian, and I actually thought that. So um, what? So if, if someone, I mean, because philosophy sounds, it, well, it depends. It could be like a French thing with a special hat, and you do something in museums, or it could be something you do, I mean, it, focus on, on linguistic analysis and really right. counting down. And sometimes it looks like a lot of math. So what do you think? I mean, when someone asks you, when you say you're a professor of philosophy, um, when you're at the grocery store or something, uh, I don't know why you'd have this conversation, but imagine you did. Um, by now, surely you have a short answer of when they say, oh, philosophy. So what do you do? Just like talk about uh, the meaning of life or something, you know? It's like, actually really hard. Like, I feel like I can explain it if they have 15 minutes, but they don't want to <laughs> yeah. wait that long. No. No, but I mean, again, so I would say that, that philosophy is, is using unaided reason. So not relying on revelation, asking and answering foundational questions or fundamental questions. Now, if you think that sociological questions are the most foundational questions, then that's a philosophical claim. As far as I can tell, it's a false philosophical claim, but it is philosophical because it's attempting to, to state something, you know, fundamental. Um, if you think that everything boils down to grammar, again, that's a philosophical claim. I don't think it's a true philosophical claim. But it's a philosophical claim. Um, so whenever you're trying to ask the most basic and foundational questions, then you're doing philosophy. Right. And some of our some of our listeners might say, well, the most basic, well, no, my, my, maybe of our listeners, but a lot of people today might say, well, the most basic questions, well, obviously that's physics. So right. physics just is, that's obviously, is philosophy just like, fantasy world physics or is it pre-physics or before newton showed up and the boys i mean we have a longer story to yeah, tell about yeah, this yeah. but but when you get someone who's a hard a hard physicist you could say sure um you might i'm sure you want to say well not really the basic questions right yeah i mean the question the claim that physics is the most foundational um study that is a philosophical claim mm -hmm. uh, it's not obviously true um 
And so if I started pushing you on it and you would, you would not be able to appeal to physics in order to justify the claim that physics was the most basic thing. You would have to give me some sorts of reasons and those reasons you would be doing philosophy when you did that, whether you yeah. liked it or not, you would be doing philosophy. Now it maybe turns out that, I mean, like it's theoretically possible that philosophy turns out to be this tiny field. And all it really can show is that physics is the most foundational thing. <laughs> I mean, apart from that little tiny rump philosophy. Okay. Yeah. But like, I, I mean, I don't think that's true. Um, yeah. It's and not even a then, stupid it'd be cool. idea. Yeah. Yeah. It would, yeah. This is it Quine's cool. view. This is Quine's view, basically. Uh, I we'll guess so. One Quine, I think. I guess yeah. so. Yeah. 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 Do enough for the sciences and let it go. All right. Now, the what's interesting, of course, so switching over to the Catholic side of things. So in the Protestant tradition, uh, which I which I grew up in, philosophy and theology were like, well, you know, I don't know, Athens and Babylon or something, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Jerusalem and Babylon. This was something Jerusalem that, and Babylon. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in the in the Protestant in the Protestant seminary curriculum, you start out with scripture and then you do theology. And then if you're nuts, you might do the philosophy on the side or something. Yeah, Whereas yeah. in the Catholic tradition, the Catholic tradition, you start off with with philosophy. Right. And then you do theology and you might do scripture yeah. kind of mixed in with this sort of thing. So it's the exact opposite. Protestants are extremely suspicious of philosophy. Right. That's the wisdom of man, not the wisdom of God. But Catholics are not. We're very... We seem to be traditional. I mean, the greatest, some of the greatest philosophers are Catholic. Right. Catholic, um, uh, Descartes, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, sort of thing. So, um, but what is what would you say? What's distinctive about Catholic philosophy? Can you do you have to, is to be a good philosopher? Do you have to be Catholic? Does Catholic does a Catholic philosopher add something different to the game? Is there something that makes you a card-carrying Catholic philosopher other than the, are you just a philosopher that goes to mass or do you right, philosophize right. in a particular way? Or do you, is there more things that are open to your philosophical acumen, you could say as a cat? Like, did you, is yeah. there, are there doors open to your philosophical tool chest or different things in there? Or what do you think, what, how's, what's the relationship to, to Catholic and Catholic philosophy? Yeah. No, it's a tricky question because if, if, um, you 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 could go over the edge and end up saying that Catholic philosophy means philosophy that's beholden to revelation, but then I just that's what theology is, right? Yes. So so um I think I would put it this way that a Catholic philo I mean, you could just be a philosopher who goes to mass and you'd be a Catholic and a philosopher, but you wouldn't really be a Catholic philosopher in mm -hmm. the sense that we're trying to get at here. I would say that a on a sort of minimalistic definition, a Catholic philosophy is one that doesn't rule out the faith. It's open to it. So if you're okay. like a hardcore materialist, that's not um, consistent with the Catholic faith. And um, if you're, you know, some kind of many kinds of Aristotelianism are kind of um, open to the faith in the sense that they don't contradict it. And so you, if you could keep thinking and end up saying Christian things. Um, but I would go a little farther too. I think that there's a certain kind of philosopher who gets some of his ideas from the fact that he's Catholic. I mean, when you become a philosopher, well, you always bring your whole self with you when you do philosophy. So there's some stuff that you already believe. Now you should ask questions about it because maybe some of the things that you already believe are not that great. But the fact is, if you're Catholic, you already believe in God. You already believe that there's an immortal soul, stuff like that. So that suggests lines of inquiry to you in mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, now, it doesn't sort of become philosophy as such unless you can give purely rational arguments for it, right? So if you're a Catholic and a philosopher and you say, you know, so it's got to be the case that God exists because, I mean, I already know that I'm Catholic. Yeah. Um, but you can't think of any good arguments for it, then it hasn't really become part of your philosophy. But if you can come up with good rational arguments for it, now all of a sudden you have a philosophical belief in God. But yeah, you got a tip from theology or from the faith, and that's perfectly, that's fine. Yeah. I like that. To, I like to get a little help from the from the faith to do these things. That they're philosophers and 
it can get help from the faith and faith i expect i expect we'll talk about in a second can get help from philosophers so do you think what let's put it this way um has what has the faith or the you know, the catholic faith uh, how has that helped philosophy in any way we live in a fallen world of course and so if we were in a pre-fallen world or something maybe philosophy could continue on as a perfect discipline um without any without any sin or yeah. distractions or something but you might imagine since we live in a fallen world uh, and that affects, of course, our minds and not only our wills and this sort of thing, that everything needs to be helped by by the grace of Christ or by the by the grace of sacraments or by the by the church, you could say. I mean, do you think there is is there any way that the, that the faith has helped helped you or just people to think better philosophically? I mean, you said gives you more things. Would you say that's what it just it reminds you of certain things, or is there a way the faith helps? And then we'll turn around and talk about how philosophy can help. The right. Faith. Well. Good. So, I mean, in one way, it does just give you stuff to think about. But I think it's more than that. If you, in fact, you know, are a Catholic um, or any kind of believing Christian, there's stuff that you're already committed to. And that serves as a kind of guardrail. Mm -hmm. So there's certain views. I mean, you'll, you may entertain crazy views while you're thinking that stuff happens, but you're not going to go over those guardrails. Um, so you, you'll, you'll be like, whoa, what if atheism were true? What would that be like? But you don't actually go, yeah, I guess I'm an atheist now. Right. So, um, um, so it kind of keeps you, um, you know, from going off the cliff now, again, like it hasn't, if, if you, if you, if the only reason that you have not given up belief in God is faith, that's not bad, but it's not philosophy. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't substitute for philosophy, but it can keep your philosophy from going too far off the rails. So, you know, like if they're, if I'm thinking through a philosophical, uh, you know, line of thought and I end up with some conclusions that manifestly contradict the faith, I can tell that they're wrong. Now, mm -hmm. I might not know why they're wrong. It might take me 20 years or I might never figure it out. You know, I might go to my grave like, I don't know what's wrong with that. <laughs> It looks like a good argument to me, but I know that it's not a good argument. I guess I wish I, wish I were smarter, you know. That can happen. That's fine. Um, but it's good for your philosophy that, um, well, I keep using this metaphor, but that you have guardrails. Yeah. I, well, I like that because, you know, so much in, in life, like in the moral sphere, the church yep. provides sort of guardrails. So you don't have to come up with, I mean, if you ask right. someone like, well, why is murder wrong? You think, well, because you're not allowed to kill innocent people. And you think, okay, well, why is not that? And you can kind of really go on this uh, and keep going down. Eventually they're going to have to, it's going to get to a fundamental issue. And, yeah. but the church provides as well. It's just, you know, we've got the 10 commandments here. We have particular precepts of the church and it gives you, I, I like guardrails. And I suppose we feel today in modernity that that's a disappointing aspect um, and we might feel for some reason that we need, we don't need guardrails and that's like a second order thing. But I suspect that anyone who's reflected for a moment, uh, on parenting or just living as a human being, uh, guardrails are really great. I mean, yes. not, maybe not for, maybe not in bowling, but in general, in life, it's nice to have some yeah. like markers or buoys that you're steering between so that you don't have to reinvent, right? It's the idea of having autonomy and coming to everything yourself is a, not only, I don't know, that's not only Herculean and, and insane, but I don't think it's that attractive, right? Yeah, that's probably right. I think it's also... I know, I'm tempted to say that in a way... Okay, so here's, here's a thought that sounds attractive, but that I think might actually be backwards. I've never had this... I've never said this before, so we're just going to see what happens here. Um, I'm making this up as I go along. So here's the thought. Really smart people don't need guardrails. Guardrails are for like people who aren't that smart, but philosophers don't need guardrails because they can mm -hmm. figure everything out for themselves. Okay. That has a kind of plausibility to it. But I would say that if you actually get engaged in the process of doing philosophy, one of the things you notice is that you develop the ability to think up views that are actually so much crazier than the average person could ever mm -hmm. think of. Yeah. Um, and so you can go much farther off. I mean, not just like over the edge of the cliff, but like deep into outer space. Um, and the better you are at philosophy, the worse it can get. So there's a funny way in which mm -hmm. if you're yeah. very philosophically skillful, you need guardrails even more.
Right. No, that's I I I think that's that's what a great thought because the average person crazy thoughts might be um that they're aliens and they they uh uh visited the earth and this sort of thing. But a philosopher isn't going to believe that most likely, but he might believe that there are infinite versions of you spanning different multiverses at every given moment sure. that you have no communication with whatsoever. And you might think, well, I what happened to evidence? <laughs> I don't understand. Yeah. So yeah, that that the that the mind as it goes more expansive needs more assistance than less assistance if you're not trying to expand as much mentally then maybe it's okay to have less fewer guardrails on it i like that um okay so we've talked about how we've talked about how the faith might be helping philosophy but you're you're in your you both theology and philosophy but you do most of your work in in, in philosophical theology or philosoph or just philosophy straight philosophy um now it's time for you to make your case for how you're helping the church. Um, how does philosophy uh, assist? Why why should we care about philosophy? Why should uh, why should the church support philosophy and those entering philosophical realms? Look, why why isn't revelation enough? Uh, why isn't you know, the the faith enough? Yeah. Why aren't why aren't Protestants right? Basically, I guess. Yeah. Like that. Well, okay. Actually, can I, I want to comment on that Protestant Catholic thing? a bit um please do it seems to me that the sort of uh, one of, of the sort of deep differences between protestantism and catholicism is that catholics are looking for ways in which creatures can help lead us to god where protestants are mm -hmm. interested in ways in which creatures get in the way and they want to clear that uh, clear that aside now, that's actually an important part of the spiritual life, figuring out what creatures are getting in your way. So both of these insights are important. But I think there's, it's not really a coincidence that Catholics are really into philosophy because they think that thinking in a natural way about creatures can lead us to God. Um, it's not, it's dangerous, but it's also, it's like a bridge, but you know, I mean, you could fall off a bridge, but on the other hand, bridges are good because they get you to the other side. All right. Um, but anyway, that's just a thought about why Catholicism in particular has seemed so hospitable to philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, okay, so there's a, um, a sort of relatively speaking shallow reason why philosophy is good for you. Um, I mean, it's not, I just say it's relatively shallow. This is what I would call the LSAT reason. So mm -hmm. like if you want to major in philosophy and your parents are like, what? You want to major in what? You tell them, oh, well, philosophy majors do really great on the LSAT. Mm -hmm. So philosophy just kind of makes you think really rigorously. Now, I don't know where people got the idea that philosophy has this monopoly on rigorous thinking. I would hope that all fields of study do that. It's not like the they English don't. department. It's not like the English department has monopoly on grammar. So, but anyway, it does seem, for whatever reason, it does seem to be the case that going being put through the paces philosophically does help people to develop their minds in a more rigorous way mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason. So that's a reason. Um, but that's, uh, that's only, you know, that's the LSAT reason, right? So, yeah. so I want to say something about how I think philosophy can help you do theology better. And I also think it can just help you in everyday life. So, um, it's easy to get mixed up in your thinking about religious matters. Um, so, you know, we've, we've all had this conversation where somebody goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus. So, like, is he Jesus or is he God? Because, like, he's the son of God, right? So he's not really God. He's Jesus. And you're like, whoa, 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 hold on. But you can't. Now, you could just say, that sounds heretical to me. But, like, that doesn't mm -hmm. help them. They have a question. Yeah. But the question uh, requires getting some things untangled. So you have to talk about the concept of a nature and you have to talk about the concept of person. And then you have to say, okay, so Jesus is one person, but he has two natures. And now you can do this and you can work through it. But when you do it, you're basically taking concepts from philosophy. You may be adapting them for theological purposes, but they, they started in philosophy. And so a lot of the history of the early church is um, 
smart people taking stuff that they found in philosophy and figuring out how to use it to um, sort out tangles in theology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Bible looks contradictory until you learn to think about it in the right way. And philosophy helps you help supply a lot of the concepts and distinctions that we need for untangling it all. So that's a way in which philosophy is helpful in theology and just, you know, in religious thinking more generally. I also think though that philosophy can help you just in a sort of everyday basis. So here's an example. Aristotle distinguishes three kinds of friendship. He says, some of our friends, they're, well, he said, and he, he distinguishes them on the basis of why we love our friends. So sometimes we love them because they're useful. And sometimes we love them because they're pleasant. And sometimes we love them because we respect, uh, you know, their virtuous character. Now, it might sound funny to say love and to say friendship here, right? So let's just reconfigure it um, um, and call this like his theory of human relationships. That was that was the, uh, the terminology that I once heard used by... Um, an old uh, confer of yours, Kurt Pritzel. Father okay. Pritzel called Aristotle's theory of friendship Aristotle's comprehensive theory of human relationships. Yeah. It takes a lot of pressure off, right? Because then you're not yes. really, are those really your friends? friends. Yeah. So yeah, so like the person who, who fixes your car. That's a relationship that you have with someone and you provide him with a living and he provides you with a functional car. That's a human relationship. That's one type of human relationship. There's another kind of human relationship where you hang out with people because they're funny. And then there's this last kind where you hang out with them because you really respect their character and they're such good people. Now, all three of these kinds of friendship or human relationship, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with any of them. Um, but it's good to have, and everybody kind of has a feel for this, but it's good to have thought it out philosophically. Um, so first of all, you, you'll be less likely to get confused. Like sometimes, you know, that, that thing, do people still use this word oversharing or too much uh, information? You I know, think you're so, in the, yes. You're in, you're, you're in the line at, at, at Walmart and you start telling them about your gallbladder. It's like, mm, yeah, TMI, no. TMI. TMI, right? So, so um, uh, that's because you're getting confused. This is a friendship of utility. Pay the money, say something friendly and get out, right? So they're, yeah. so, and they're getting confused about their types of friendship. Or if you taking your friends of, um, you know, your friend, your, your virtue friends, and you're constantly just trying to figure out what you can get out of them. You're using them, you know, that's not right. Um, but also another way is once you have this distinction of different kinds of friendship, and I've had this experience with students, like we'll study this. And then some of them will say, you know, I've been thinking all my friends are friends of utility or friendship. That's, that's not so good. So making these distinctions has helped them to grasp something important about their own life. So this is a way in which it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's just a few pages taken from some book that's 2,500 years old or whatever, but um, in another, not quite, but anyway, whatever. <laughs> uh, it helps you to sort out your own life and to live better because in the end, you can never be too clear or too rational. It's always turns out to be useful. Right. That's, yeah, that's, I know, um, I know G.K. Chesterton, Father Gregory Love says that insanity is something like being too hyper rational or something, but in a way you wouldn't say that you can't be hype. I know what he means by that, but yeah, there's yeah, yeah. always, there's always looking fine grain and being more attentive to what I think you mentioned the, the word distinctions. I've always, perhaps this is from Monsignor Sokolowski's experience, yeah. but that, that making distinctions, uh, is, is a kind of philosophical act, uh, par excellence. Yeah. Being able to look at something and say and look at reality just like everyone else is. The philosophers don't like see things that no one saw. Like, hey, we see like halos right. or ghosts or other spirit things flying around. We're not like mystics. Although, if you go to a bookstore and you look at the metaphysics section, I remember the first time I noticed this. And there's nothing on usia or substance or it's relation not, or the it's categories. Not, it's it's that's magic. That's not what I call metaphysics. Exactly, but it's new age. It's new age, exactly. Yeah, philosophers aren't really new age people, but that that philosopher looks at at the 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 world and points out a distinction that you can't yes. see, but makes all the difference. 
you yeah. know, and with the friendships. I remember teaching at Providence College in Nicobacan Ethics uh, for business ethics, and we were doing the three friendships. And I said, one well, take, really? I mean, these are these are joints of reality. This is a relational joint yeah. between how you interact with people. This is, this is real. You can't like taste it or touch it or feel it, but if you, yeah. it's real, this relation. And the, yeah, the student's saying, uh, I think all my friendships are pleasure, really. Um, and th that's an important insight, but only gained from philosophy. It's not like they were in biology and found out right. that, you know, if you have a femur this long, then you're probably in a, you know, yes. a utilitarian friendship. Um, that's right. So philosophy has, it, it helps you to see things in, in the world that you wouldn't otherwise see, although it's not like you're seeing ghosts or something. I think that's, yeah, that's so right. it's helpful for the average person. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're not thinking about other things. You're thinking about the same things, but in a different way. And somehow you're, well, you're penetrating to more fundamental levels. Um, yes. Categories yeah, I, and whatnot. Yeah. Philosophy doesn't study different things, but things differently. Um, That's right. And not like, not differently in the sense of uh, getting high or doing strange. It's valuable, really real. Gets the action. Not just like, yeah, not just like now you can make money off this. What, what um, if my kids, won't yell stats. one of my kids mentioned to i'm trying to remember which kid of mine it was uh, okay so one of my daughters she mentioned to some kid in college some one of her fellow college classmates that her father was a philosophy professor and he said oh so your dad smokes weed right she goes no he goes yes he does if he's a philosopher he smokes weed she goes no i i, I don't think so he goes no no definitely but yeah, no, yeah. that's not what philosophy is. <laughs> yeah, and, she's, and she said, yes, he does, but that's not because he's a philosophy major, a philosophy <laughs> no. professor. That's a totally different question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, good. So I like this. The reason the philosophy is helpful in this way in seeing life. Now, um, the question I, and we talked about, so Aristotle showed up here and Thomas Aquinas, of course, and people listening might say, yeah, philosophy has been great and gives some concepts. I mean, Aristotle and Nicobacan Ethics and Thomas Aquinas and the Summa Theologiae and other places, um, and Augustine, perhaps, in the Confessions. But, you know, since the 1600s, nah, I mean, what a waste of time with philosophy or something. So just as a, since you are a man who has studied modern philosophy and contemporary philosophy and our contemporary philosopher yourself, you could say, um, are there any particular insights, would you say, for Catholics in particular or something, or that a helpful philosophical insights that have come up, I don't know, since the 1600s, 1700s, dare we say, since the 20th, 19th century or something? Yeah. Do you think philosophy is, is did philosophy just like stop at some point that we should be paying oh, attention I see. to? Oh, yeah. so in other words, like is all modern philosophy garbage and we should just study that's only right. Aquinas? That's right. No, that's right. No, that's I what I want to know. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, well, for, no, you should, you should think about modern philosophy too, right? Um, but why? So, one answer, which is true as far as it goes, but which I don't really like, well, which bothers me. One answer is you should study modern philosophy because you need to know how to refute it. But that's, mm -hmm. you, you do need to know how to refute bad things. I guess that's true. But that's a bad attitude, right? When your whole approach is like, how can I beat on this thing? So that's fine, but you also have to be on the lookout for the good stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that's weird is sometimes um, philosophy that's bad is bad in a really good way, meaning that it gets confused, but then when you try to figure out what's wrong with it, you learn a lot of stuff that you would not have learned in any other way. Um, here, I'm sort of riffing on something that um, the philosopher, the Catholic philosopher, Elizabeth Anscombe said about David Hume. She said, boy, a lot of his ideas are ridiculous, but it's very hard to figure out why, and you learn so much. Um, so, um, so that's already something. But also... Um, and so like they force you to th so even so when somebody comes up and says like maybe causation is not a real fact in the world that forces you to go back and actually think about what you mean by causation and right which hume is sort of an example of that okay so another thing is there's a lot of um things that need to be thought about that because we know more about the world than thomas aquinas did um mm -hmm. You know, ev everything having to do with science, pretty, like pretty much everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, well, he didn't have everything wrong, but quite a lot. And so sometimes it doesn't matter. A lot of times it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does matter. But also I think that there have been 
um, insights that modern philosophers have thought about more. So let me mention just two examples, um, one of which I haven't given a whole lot of thought about, but I think this is right, is that um, I think modern people tend to think more about historical processes and how things change throughout history. It's not like, you know, people 800 years ago didn't know that things changed, but I don't think they gave that mm -hmm. as deep a level of thought um, as some modern philosophers have done. Um, but another thing that I find interesting, and in a way this is this seems like picky and technical, but I think it's actually super important. It's something about language, which was not absolutely seen for absolutely the first time, but really thought about and developed in a really remarkable way around the middle of the 20th century is um, what they call speech acts. So mm -hmm. if you let's like take Augustine and say, like, what do you think about language? Mostly what he's going to tell you is you use it to say what you're thinking. And he's aware it's a little more complicated than that. And like the medievals knew about contracts and vows and stuff. They had to, right? But, um, but in the middle of the 20th century, um, some philosophers like J.L. Austin and John Searle spent a lot of time thinking about things that we do with language that are not making claims about what's true. So we greet people, we ask questions, we give commands. There's a lot of ways to use language. And I think that in some form or other is going to become a sort of part of the permanent inheritance of philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there should be there should be like, well, OK, yeah, somebody um, I hope somebody picks this up. There should be like a Thomistic version of speech act theory because mm. speech acts is a great, great idea. Yes. Well, that's yeah, that's so OK. So, so dear, dear listeners, um, if you're thinking about doing graduate work or something in philosophy, Thomistic speech acts, an account of that. Um, Professor Gorman has given you the green light for that. Yeah, and would be happy I'll, to I'll uh, you. have you study under him. Yeah, that sounds like um, fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and it would be because, and especially since, since, I mean, even the in the priesthood aspect, I mean, consecration exactly. and the acts that we do with this, a confession. I mean, thinking about the absolute, we do a lot with words because, well, shockingly, Christ is the logos and He's the Word of God. So language that does things, Christ, you know, God in Genesis creation speaks forth great. There's lots to say about this. So, um, yeah, so please, if, you've, if you're thinking about doing philosophy, Professor Gorman would be happy to have you. But we are very happy to ha have had Professor Gorman to hopefully explain a little bit about philosophy and theology for our listeners. Also, guess to think about how important philosophy is. You don't need to be a technical philosopher, but just an everyday person making distinctions in the world and thinking clearly about things. And how uh, the faith, faithful need not fear philosophy, even modern philosophy. We, we believe in things because of revelation. But we also believe in things because we can think about them clearly with the guardrails of the faith, the greatest gift in in our in our thought as well. So, Professor Gorman, thank you so much for for uh, spending time with us and talking about philosophy and encouraging all of us to uh, to think philosophically. Thanks. It's been really thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening to this episode. Those who are listening or watching on online, uh, for God's planning, so follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or like, subscribe, leave a five star review or a five moon review or a five sun review or whatever kind of review. If you like to donate, if you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, follow the link in the description on the page. You can also follow the links to in the description to shop Godsplaining merchandise uh, and to get in more information about up upcoming Godsplaining events like pilgrimages, retreats, and these sort of things. So thanks again to Professor Gorman for, uh, for coming on and speaking to us. And know that we're praying for you and have may you be praying for us in our work in evangelizing and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. 